Greetings, this is Greg. I want to address all the comments from the live chat during my recent P47 range debate. Several years ago, I made this video, which is counter to the standard narrative told by historians in regards to World War II fighter aircraft range and bomber escorts. The standard narrative is that the United States did not have a fighter that could escort deep into Germany until the P-51B Mustang showed up in very early 1944. That narrative is designed to absolve military leadership of what I consider to be their failings. The truth is that the P-47 Thunderbolt did have the range in 1943 when equipped with a drop tank, which was something easy to do. But U.S. Army Air Force leadership prevented that from happening in a timely manner, leading to a huge loss of U.S. bombers and crews. I'll put a link to the original video in the description and, of course, a link to the debate. Now, during the debate, a lot of you wrote some very good comments and questions in the chat. However, I could not see them at the time. Only the moderator could. From time to time, he would feed his questions. But the nature of this sort of thing is that we only got a small number of them. Now, I'm going to go through all of them, and there are about 500 in total, so to keep this moving, I'm not going to respond to every single one. A lot of them are people saying hello, or I'm excited to be here, or something like that, and I do appreciate every comment, but I don't want this to be a three-hour long video. Also, I'm not going to take the time to put up documents or anything else in this video. With 500 comments to go through, I need to keep this moving. However, I do have another video coming on this channel with the documentation to back up everything I said in the debate and here today as well. So let's get going. I'm going to say hello to everybody. I'm glad to see iFly Central is here. He was one of my very first subscribers. He also has a pretty good YouTube channel. It focuses a lot on civilian flying and certain flight simulators. Central, buddy, I'd really like to see you make the switch over to DCS. It's a lot of effort, but well worth it. Cobbin Ford, a professional tandem paragliding pilot from Switzerland. You know, I can't think of a lot of things in aviation that sound more fun than uh, paragliding in Switzerland. I'd really like to see some YouTube footage of that. I'll see if he has a channel. Maybe he does. Chris Fahey, I know who that is. Uh, Chris Fahey is a pretty well-known warbird pilot, flies on the air show circuit, uh, P-38s, MiG-15s. I'm not sure what else. Uh, he flies with planes of fame out of Chino, California. Chris, I'm really glad to see you here. Moving on, uh, Gold Leader, like your name, I have no idea what you're talking about. Glad to see we have somebody here from Poland. Michael Mayo, um, glad to see you, I, I know who you are, I see your comments all the time. Obviously, I know you're being sarcastic, this isn't going to become violent. Uh, Bill and I are both very passionate about this subject, and I know that came out in the debate, but um, I think we have quite a bit of respect for each other, at least I know I have a lot of respect for Bill. Moving on, Max's models. I'm glad to see you here. I believe, if I remember correctly, Max is a retired airline pilot. He has a very good channel. I watch it from time to time, mostly on model building, but there's some other things in there, firearms and stuff. Uh, Max says we can always complain about designs with the hindsight of history. I don't disagree with that, although I'm not really sure what that comment is in reference to, because, of course, everybody in chat is responding to something during the debate, and I'm trying to take the comment by itself. I'll say this, the problems that I was talking about are not really design related. It's a lack of implementing stuff that had been designed and or was very easy to design. This is amazing. Appreciate that. Yes, I do appreciate likes and subscribes. Those, those things do help me out quite a bit. Adam, the P-47 was the beast of fighters. That's an interesting description and I think somewhat accurate. Andrew should do the presidential debate. Well, they should contact Andrew about that. I don't disagree. Red Max, Greg just buttoned up, couldn't handle the sexiness. Yes, of course. My wife uh, finds me very attractive and is paranoid about other females finding me the same way. So, you know, I got to minimize the sexiness. And also, I wanted to meet Andrew halfway. I see he was concerned about the female swooning over him as well. He buttoned up all the way. I'm older. I don't need to go quite that far. Adam Strange, could the P-47 have been modified for longer range without compromising performance? It could have been, and it was. They constantly increased the fuel load. Well, there was one increase in internal fuel, and then multiple changes regarding drop tanks throughout the years. Then there was a, actually a second internal fuel increase with the November model, which also involved all new wings. Performance, even with the increasing weight, was kept up by increasing horsepower, and ultimately with the November with a new larger wing. So, yeah, they were able to modify it for longer range, and 
not only not compromise performance, but increase performance. The next two comments appear to be from me. Let's keep in mind that anytime you see a comment in the chat from Greg's Airplanes and Automobiles during a live debate like this, I'm not seeing those comments. I'm not typing this. That's Andrew, the moderator, doing that for me. And it looks like he did a good job. He's asking you to subscribe to my channel, and he's asking you to subscribe to his channel, which you most certainly should. He is doing tremendous work in finding veterans and getting interviews with these guys. A lot of people that, a lot of veterans that nobody's ever heard of, but they have important things to say, and their voices should be heard. There's a lot of great information there. Uh, please check that out. Gold Leader. Later models were modified for longer range. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, yes, drop tanks were used in the jug. That's true from very early on. Bill has left the chat. Yeah, I'm worried this is going to be a theme. I see the next couple things are about that. Uh, you guys have no idea how much work Andrew had to do to make this happen. And a lot of that work was simply in getting Bill to be able to do it from his location. And yeah, there were a lot of problems with that. But believe me, considering all the troubles we went through, I think this was the best we could do. And... Uh, I apologize for the connection interruptions, but it was that or have no debate, and we just couldn't put it off any longer. This debate has been years in the making. Well, I should say it's been brewing for years, but it took a couple months of work to actually make this happen. All right, stay-at-home astronaut. My great-uncle flew P-47s in the Pacific Theater, destroyed four aircraft on one mission. Initially, that sounds impressive, but then he says, well, landing at the base and running into other parked P-47s, so I take it to mean that he destroyed four P-47s. Those sort of accidents were not uncommon. With just about every type of aircraft, far more planes were lost in accidents than as a result of enemy fire. Walter, so far so good for Greg. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Rusty's learning about P-47s. I'm... I'm glad to hear that. Unity Motorsports Garage. Uh, that's a very good channel uh, run by a fellow named Andy, Andy Wood. He's extremely knowledgeable, one of the top guys on YouTube in terms of automotive knowledge. He uh, deals with a lot of American V8 stuff and has a lot of great tuning information there. I don't mean tuning like laptop computer stuff, although there is some of that, but basics regarding air fuel ratio, camshaft timing, ignition timing, how compression ratio works with these things and how to make the drive line not, you know, come apart on you and the plane to hook up and go down the track. Uh, it's just a very good channel. In fact, recently one of his videos really helped me out with a weird nitrous oxide problem I couldn't figure out. Anyway, that's a that'll be a video for another time. I really do want to talk about that. Moving on, um, Brian, Bob, yeah, yeah, you're right. Gold leader. U.S. considered England a lower priority theater until the buildup for D-Day. Okay, that's really a topic for another channel. The short version, though, I'll just give it to you, is that the U.S. and the United Kingdom had some sort of agreement to prioritize the European theater. However, the people that do the math on this sort of thing and, and add things up seem to be in agreement that in terms of money, manpower, numbers of things, the U.S. slightly prioritized the Pacific theater. But... Again, that's something that's really beyond the scope of my channel. I'm not exactly sure what Gold Leader is responding to there. Uh, Cobbin Ford, yeah, hats off to Bill for showing up to the debate. I'm really happy about that. He's not one of these guys that just, you know, lurks in some form in some corner of the Internet that I'm not aware of and criticizes me all day long. He He's willing to step up to the plate, so I tip my hat to Bill, certainly. Michael Mayo, Greg's best point so far, 100% proven that drop tanks were not a priority before 1943. I'm not sure what point he's referencing, but yeah, I agree. It's 100% proven that the uh, USAAF leadership was not prioritizing drop tanks before 1943. And very clear evidence of that is the fact that they put effort into the YB-40 instead of drop tanks. Count Bugula, so did he not hear any of Greg's opening arguments, meaning Bill? That's going to be problematic for the debate. I suppose it would be problematic, except that I don't know if he heard my opening argument or not, but he is certainly familiar with everything in my opening argument because Bill has been uh, talking about my video for a number of years. He has probably watched it a number of times. Uh, he is certainly familiar with all of my arguments and everything that I brought up in my opening. So I just don't think there's going to be a problem there. 
Gold Leader, the USAF in England received aircraft after North Africa and Pacific units. Um, it, I guess it depends on what you mean by received. The P-38s did go to England first because that's where they flew them, and they flew them there in 1942. Hap Arnold then directed them to North Africa. Gary Hill, doctrine of unescorted bombers was pursued contrary to the logic in the air, just as ground forces pursued the tank doctrine to the, ex the tank destroyer doctrine to the exclusion of better tanks. I think that's a reasonable analogy. I'd want to look into it more before I absolutely committed to that. Walter, I'm not sure I would say the 8th and 9th Air Force had a lower priority. A lot of depends on what you consider priority and when you look at it, but yeah, okay. Chris Fahey, uh, combat radius is determined by internal fuel. Army fighters drop tanks fed the engines, not internal tanks. Uh, we're going to come back to that. A 305-gallon P-47 Razorback didn't have the range to fight for any time past 450 miles. Okay, the core of Chris's comment here is just spot on. It's very good. Combat radius is indeed determined by internal fuel because it, it doesn't matter how much drop tank fuel you have. If you fly out 400 miles and you drop your tanks, your external tanks, you now have to fight the fight and return to base with hopefully some amount of reserve fuel on internal fuel. So internal fuel determines combat radius, absolutely. In the case of the P-47, because it's only got 305 gallons of internal fuel, when we're talking about Razorbacks, generally speaking, once it doesn't matter if you have a 200 gallon belly tank, uh, twin 108 wing tanks, or one twin 150 or 165 gallon wing tanks, they all have a combat radius according to all the Air Force documentation. And the numbers vary a little bit, but they're almost always for those tanks between 450 and 475 miles. And the longest range Razorback flights uh, where they went out and back with drop tanks are about 470 miles. So yeah, that 450 mile number is really, really good. If you do the math, you can come up with 500 miles or a little bit beyond, but you do have to factor in there may be some uh, headwind. You might fight longer than you planned. Maybe your plane's a little thirstier than you planned. Maybe you want to return home at a higher speed for some reason. There are a lot of reasons that 450 miles is a good, safe bet. I agree with that number. The second sentence he wrote here is not technically correct, but I think it's a case of Chris typing fast and trying to get you know the comment in because the chat's moving along. This statement that Army fighter drop tanks fed the engines, not internal tanks, and I, I'm sort of guessing what Chris means by that. What I think he means is that unlike some airplanes where the external tanks feed into a internal tank and then the internal tank feeds to the engine, U.S. fighters didn't work that way for the most part. The P-47 certainly doesn't. After takeoff, let's say you taxi out and take off on the main tank, which is what you would normally do. And at some point, certainly not lower than a thousand feet, the pilot is going to be able to switch over to the external drop tank, let's say a belly tank. So when he switches over to the belly tank, now the engine is feeding directly from the belly tank. However, because the fuel system delivers more fuel to the engine from the belly tank than the engine can use, unless it's at a really high power setting, that excess fuel has to go somewhere. You don't want to dump it overboard, so you put it back into the main tank, which is now less than full because, remember, you taxied out and took off on it. And depending on your power setting, that rate of return could be as high as 10 gallons per hour. So after takeoff, when you switch over to the belly tank, the external tank actually will be feeding the internal tank, but only as sort of a secondary function. I hope that makes sense, and uh, maybe Chris will chime in. I, I, I think that's what he meant there, but I'm not 100% sure. Gold Leader, they had a lower priority until the buildup for D-Day. Um, yeah, I'm not going to get into the priority thing. I mean, that, that could be a whole video on itself and is very complicated. Charles, curious about the General Doolittle's role in all of this. Wasn't Doolittle insisting on more P-51s to the exclusion of other types for escort duty? Yes. However, that's in 1944. In 1944, when Doolittle took over the fighters in the 8th Air Force, he did prefer the P-51 for escort duty. There's no question about that. That does not mean that the P-47, had it been equipped with drop tanks, could not have done the job in 1943, or even for the most part in 1944. Uh, General Doolittle is, you could, you could argue that he was a bomber mafia guy. I mean, technically he is. However, he was not a true believer in the cause. You know, as with any belief system, you have people that have different levels of adherence to the core principles and beliefs, and General Doolittle was just interested in winning the war without necessarily supporting anybody's doctrine. Uh, everybody knows about the Doolittle Raid. 
After that, he was promoted to general, uh, from lieutenant colonel, I believe, to major general, two-star general. Could be wrong about that. In any case, what most people don't know is what General Doolittle was doing between the Doolittle raid and uh, 1944 when he went to the 8th Air Force. And he was in Africa, and he was leading from the front. He would fly missions with his pilots, which was considered a pretty risky thing to do because he was a general and knew a lot of secrets and he could have been captured. But in any case, he was uh, the real deal, led from the front. He was a real pilot. I mean, he was a tremendous guy, one of the one of the great figures in U.S. history, not just in World War II history. Uh, not, not enough is talked about his exploits in Africa. But anyway, I guess that was a long way of saying the short answer to your, to your question is yes, but that does not uh, exclude the mistakes 8th Air Force leadership and USAF leadership made in 1943. Okay, Chris Fahey, yep, after Torch, 8th Air Force fighters, Spitfires were tasked in North Africa. 8th was second place to the invasion of North Africa. Yeah, okay. Uh, Chris also says, yes, taking command in January 1944, after testing three types at REE Farnborough, decided to escort, uh, decided in escort to settle on the P-51. That is all absolutely true, although I don't put a whole lot of emphasis or stock in the testing at REE Farnborough in terms of its effects on Doolittle's decision making. I think it had minimal effect. I understand that Eric Brown has a whole video where he talks about how important Eric Brown was in this whole thing. Uh, that stuff is not backed up in Doolittle's books at all. It's, it's a footnote at best. Uh, now we've got Andrew chiming in, uh, saying if you have questions, um, address them to either Greg or Bill, and Andrew will get them. The initial intent there was to give us the questions at the end of the debate, but they were just so many coming in and stacking up that occasionally Andrew just interrupted the debate to get some questions knocked out. Okay, let's move on. Bill's audio is cutting out, hard to hear his arguments. Yeah, you're telling me. I, I know all about that, and I am really apologize for it. And you think it was hard for you. Imagine how it was for me. I've got to respond to all of this stuff, and sometimes only getting every other word and not quite understanding. Although I think for the most part, uh, we did get Bill's info, and, and uh, for the most part, I was able to respond to all of it. John McGuire, did the Army Air Force ever put out a request to Republic to tell them to make a fighter with longer range or to come up with any provision for getting extra range out of the Thunderbolt. Yes, they put that out to everybody. It was called the Range Extension Program or something to that effect. And it was not for the purpose of escorting, however. It was the, for the purpose of increasing internal fuel so that they could ferry the airplanes farther and get them into theater. Now, of course, eventually it became very important for escorting as well. But uh, they also put some effort into drop tanks, but it was way too late. Uh, that's why we had so many losses in 1943. Had they just allowed Republic to do their thing, they would have had drop tanks for the P-47 in 1942 and absolutely ready to go into combat any time in 1943 with those. But they completely dropped the ball, and the paper trail backs that up. Not only the paper trail, but just the reality of looking at what actually happened, which is probably the bigger deal. Walter, General Pershing might be considered higher. Yeah, okay. Uh, Air-headed aviator, debate time on if plane can go far. All right. Goo, uh, is that a Gumby reference? Goo, anyway, smiley face. Yeah, I agree. Charles, I'm curious about the, is that a Roman numeral five or the letter V? I, 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 sorry, Charles, I don't know what you're asking me there. Teo, at least I think that's how you say that. I see Teo all the time, and I, that's how I say that uh, username in my mind. I think the description of leak proof, in quotations, leak proof, also changed at some point. Don't quote me on that. Um, don't quote you, but you put quotes in your thing. Anyway, Teo, I, I, it probably did. Definitions of things change over time. It's usually some sort of allowable tolerance, like it can get hit by X number of rounds of a certain caliber and not leak more than a certain amount or whatever. That probably did change over time, but I've not specifically read that. John, loving this so far. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Max Model. So there was a drop tank war. Um, you know, it's Max, I think you'll understand this reference. When I read this comment, I picture General Turgidson pounding his fist on the table in the war room saying, Mr. President, we cannot allow a drop tank gap. Anyway, that just came to my mind when I read your comment. Uh, chicken uh, found something funny. I don't know what. Airheaded aviator. Ah, uh, chiz. Uh, buddy, I have no idea what chiz means. Frankly, that sounds like a word my grandkids would use. Maybe I'll ask them uh, next time I'm home. I'm on the road right now. Also, audio, no video, but he's staying on. Yes, technical problems. I feel your pain. Uh, Matt says, I am handily winning. Uh, thanks, Matt. 
Moore and Rowe. Not sure I know what that means. Uh, yeah, audio problems. Good opinions and information. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate that, Brian. Uh, Coco Puff, lol, boomers. I don't believe Mr. Marshall is a boomer. I believe he's one generation before the boomers. And I know I'm not a boomer. I'm post-boomer. Andrew certainly not a boomer. No boomers were involved in the production of this video. Chris, darn tech issues. Yeah, you got that right. Uh, can you see them? I, I have no idea. Meeting software. I think the meeting software was okay, actually. By virtue of technology, Greg wins. That's pretty funny. Calum uh, says, as an autist, this is the most amazing con conversation I've ever heard slash watched. Uh, Callum the Strong, I have no idea if uh, that's meant to be a, a criticism or, or praise, but uh, either way, I'm glad you're here. Okay, Jester, I've heard arguments that Spitfire could have done escorts as well. Wow, is that a, another subject and a very deep one. Um, yes, that argument is made out there, but I'm just not going to touch that right now because anything I say will then be questioned because I'm not going to be able to put up the receipts in this format. Charles Polk, Greg, I'm curious about General's Doolittle's role in all this. Yeah, that was asked earlier. Doolittle has been insisting on more P51s. Uh, hopefully my answer a moment ago uh, sufficed for you. John McGuire, so is it Bill's point that the Air Force intended field operations to go out and purchase drop tanks or other ordnance? Well, what Bill said in the debate, I may be paraphrasing this, I hope I'm getting it right, but I think he said something that was much stronger and, in my view, more ridiculous than that. However, in defense of Bill, I think he was shooting from the hip and didn't think that through, but if I remember correctly, what he said was essentially that it's okay that the Air Force leadership did not pursue drop tanks on their own because they didn't prohibit people in the field from designing, building, testing, putting into production, and uh, using drop tanks. So, I don't know, you can take that for what it's worth. Scully's tie, well, this is going great. I believe Scully is being sarcastic because of the technical problems. I, I hear you, brother. Airheaded aviator, I thought the Bomber Mafia did expect losses for a while until it became clear that they should have been using escorts all the way. Not only did they expect a certain amount of losses, they were very accepting of losses. For example, uh, Ira Eaker thought that the losses at the short first Schweinfurt raid were totally worth it. He also was not alarmed when, on an earlier raid, they lost 27% of their bombers in one raid. It was an unescorted raid, of course. Uh, they had a different way of looking at things, and uh, these high losses were acceptable and expected to a certain extent. Uh, that's really a whole subject, and I don't want to go crazy getting into Bomber Mafia stuff here, although I really could. Walter, so this basically boils down to you believe this is a policy problem, you meaning me, Greg, uh, versus a technological problem. Yeah, I'd say that's, that's right, and uh, Michael agrees with you. Uh, you got to recall him. I, I believe Airheaded Aviator is talking about something with the software. You can't really have a debate if Bill can't hear any of Greg's arguments. Well, that's true, although I promise you Bill is familiar with all of my arguments. Internet Explorer, is he on Wi-Fi? Maybe he can move in the house. I don't know. Moving on, next slide. Larry, America really lucked into creating the greatest fighter of World War II, the Mustang. Without the British asking North American to design a new fighter, it never would have been created. Probably true, probably true with the second part anyway, that had the British not asked North American to create a fighter, we never would have had the P-51 Mustang. So, yeah, that's very fortunate the British stepped in there. As for the P-51 being the greatest fighter of World War II, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's certainly a contender for that title, but a lot depends on what you're going to do with the airplane. For example, if it's required to operate off aircraft carriers, then the Mustang's not even in the running. So it just really depends. I, I hesitate to claim one fighter was the greatest fighter of World War II, although it would be a fun discussion to have. Bill's got a potato for router. Yeah. Uh, Walter, well, clearly there seems to be more leaning towards policy than technology here. The Bomber Command consistently resisted having fighter escort for the longest time. I agree with Walter on that. Uh, John, if he maintains Republic, then he needs to explain the point of the regulations against drop tanks. Yes, that's true. The USAAF leadership threw a ton of regulatory barriers in front of manufacturers of drop tanks all throughout 1942. And 
it made it very, very difficult for any manufacturer to tool up and build drop tanks. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to argue that the Bomber Mafia was all for drop tanks, you have to explain why they made it so hard for anybody to make them, uh, at least for use within the U.S. Army Air Force. It wasn't a problem if you were going to make them for Lend-Lease aircraft. Uh, but the P-47, the only real customer of that initially was the United States. Uh, Pepe, Greg's opening arguments fire. I don't know if he means they're on fire, like they've been burned up and destroyed by Bill, or if he means that they are burning up all the opposition. Hopefully you think the latter, but I don't know. Chris Fahey, at Greg. Uh, that makes me happy. Chris knows who I am. That's kind of He's kind of a big deal, so that makes me feel special. The 9th Air Force P-51s were attached to the 8th Air Force, okay, flying from England. They were present when the 55th was first over Berlin. They did it at the same time. Really? Exactly the same time? How, how do we know that? Maybe. Maybe he's right. 8th Air Force PR mentions the 8th Air Force P-38 group. Okay, this is clearly in response to a point in the video when I said that P-38s were the first U.S. fighters over Berlin and not P-51s. And Bill disputed that and said that uh, there were 9th Air Force P-51s. And I thought, well, maybe, okay, maybe they came, came up from Italy or something. Maybe the document I read... Uh, was specific to 8th Air Force aircraft, and maybe I just didn't notice that it said first 8th Air Force fighter, so I backed off of that in the video. Um, I want to make the point that it really doesn't matter if the P-38 showed up an hour later, a day later, or a week later. The point is still made, and that point is that the P-38s had the range to go to Berlin as soon as the P-51s, and in fact did go to Berlin at about the same time. In fact, the P-38s had the range to go to Berlin way before the P-51. So that really destroys the argument that the P-51s were needed due to range. Now, just to, I said I wasn't going to put up receipts, and I'm not going to put anything on screen, but I want to read you something here. Uh, I want to read my source for this, the source saying that P-38s were the first U.S. fighters over Berlin. Now, this is from the history of the USAAF Fighter Command by... Um, a lieutenant colonel, and this is an official Air Force document. I'm not just, you know, pulling a book off the shelf of my library. So this says on page 201, quote, P-38s of the 55th group were the first American fighters to appear over Berlin on March 3rd when they flew in a sweep over the city after the bombers they were escorting had aborted due to the weather, unquote. So this document says they were the first U.S. fighters, not the first 8th Air Force fighters, although this is a document about the 8th Air Force, so maybe there's some wiggle room there. Uh, it also says that they were escorting bombers, so this was a bomber escort mission. So it absolutely proves that the P-51 was not the only airplane capable of escorting to Berlin. Uh, it wasn't... What made the P-51... This might be a discussion to actually have with Bill Marshall. I think what made the P-51 great was not so much its range, but the total package. It was relatively easy to fly. It was relatively low cost compared to a 47 or a P-38, which is what you have to compare it to. Um, and it was just an all-around really good airplane, a good dogfighter, could do ground attack, wasn't stellar there, but it could do it. I think that's the real significance of the P-51. Moving on here, uh, Remy. It seems as though Bill is taking dates and introductions of drop tanks as pylons fixed in time whereas Greg is making good arguments that these would have been much sooner without bureaucracy. Uh, yes, not only would have been much sooner, but were much sooner and then not purchased by USAAF leadership. But a uh, very good point there. Moving on, can you restart? Tell Bill to keep the video off for bandwidth. Uh, that would just be impossible to do in a timely manner. Uh, th this sort of video chatting and, and uh, live video is just not Bill's thing. Getting him to change the resolution or turn the video off, it would have just been impossible to do in a timely manner here. Uh, Chris Fahey, P-38s were in short supply, true, and needed in North Africa, true, which had priority, also true. However, none of this absolves the bomber mafia of their sins in 1942. In fact, had they been more focused on the needs for escort fighters and made that a higher priority and drop tanks a higher priority, I don't think that P-38s would have been in such short supply or needed as badly in North Africa or in Europe. And they were certainly needed in Europe. Yeah, they were needed in North Africa too, but we have a lot of dead bomber crews to account for in Europe 
specifically because fighters were unescorted. So this in no way supports Bill's argument, although all of those things are true. I'm not saying you're trying to support Bill's argument. I'm just saying I don't think this does. Joshua Monson, for Bill or Greg, what was the motivation to increase P-51B's internal fuel? Well, simply range, initially for ferrying purposes, and that's important to keep in mind within the context of this discussion, although it eventually became very important for escort missions. Wasn't it true that the added fuselage tank reduced stability and limited the maneuvers allowed with full fuel? Yes, absolutely. In the P-51, the first portion of fuel in the aft tank really had to be thought of as almost like drop tank fuel, fuel you absolutely want to burn before you get to the combat area, and it's even more important to do so in the P-51 because you can't just drop it. You do literally have to burn it, so don't mismanage your fuel system. Uh, just another consumer. Stupid government territorialism. Money for fighters would mean less money for bombers, and if your career is in bombers, your career doesn't progress. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Alex, uh, thanks for chiming in. Whiskey 11 Niner. No disrespect to Bill, but it seems like his idea of an argument is sitting, maybe he means sifting documents that were written to cover up the bomber mafia's oversight and have been disproven by actual missions flown. I basically agree with that. Bill's argument is very, very document heavy and uh, and timeline heavy of things that happened and, and my argument's quite a bit different from his. I don't look at a document and just take that at face value. I've got to look at it and then look at history and see, well, what actually happened is, yeah, they said this, but what did they actually do? I think it's very important when you're looking at military documents or anything from someone with a certain amount of political or bureaucratic skill, let's say, to judge them by what they do or don't do, not by what they say. All right, next slide. I think I'm actually going to make this one the last slide. I underestimated the magnitude of this project. We're not even a fifth of the way through all of these questions and comments, and I have no idea if anybody's even going to watch this video. So I'll see how this video does before I continue and see what you guys have to say about it. Also, I'm going to say please like and subscribe and consider joining my Patreon. I am going to be adding a ton of P-47 Thunderbolt stuff to Patreon, including three P-47 pilot manuals that you most likely have not seen, and a number of other uh, really cool things, some P-51H model Mustang things as well. All right, from John McGuire, actually, this is the key issue. Did the bomber mafia use escort fighters for shorter distance trips? I'm not sure I'd say that's the key issue. It's a little bit complicated. First of all, the bomber mafia are a group of people shoving through the bomber agenda. They aren't necessarily in charge of fighter planes, and very often they weren't. And there are anti-bomber mafia people in the Air Force as well. Uh, Claire Chenault comes to mind. He's a very prominent figure on the other side, so to speak. So the fighter plane guys are, of course, wanting to escort the bombers as far as they go, and they can go a relatively short distance across the Channel, France, Belgium, Holland, places like that. So they would escort the bombers when they could. The problem is that the bomber mafia, in charge of the bombers, and a lot of the big picture stuff, production and those sort of things, were assigning the bombers targets that were way beyond the range of the escort fighters, at least the P-47 without drop tanks and certainly the Spitfire. We're talking about targets like Kiel and Bremen, where losses were tremendous. Now, had the bomber mafia not interfered with the whole drop tank development and production, P-47s would have had 200-gallon tanks and been able to escort the bombers on those missions. Losses would have been far lower. So I hold the Bomber Mafia entirely responsible for this, but uh, no, they did not have total control over what the fighter planes did on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, if bombers are taking off from England and going over to France, you're going to have a total revolt on the bomber crews if fighters don't even, even try to go with them. All right, uh, John Williams, uh, thanks. I appreciate your kind words. Joshua, did the 8th Air Force have any problems running too rich? I understand P-38s were very limited in the Pacific until Lindbergh taught them to run lean of peak. Um, let's just drop the term lean of peak. Uh, I'll, I'll probably have to make a whole video about this, and then I'll cover the term lean of peak. But for now, know that the P-38 Lightning and the P-47 Thunderbolt II have two positions normally used in flight with a mixture control. They're auto rich, which is used for full power, auto lean, which is used for cruise. Auto lean runs a less rich mixture than auto rich, thus saves some fuel. However, the auto lean position does not lean out the mixture nearly as much as it could 
to optimize fuel economy. And pilots were scared to pull it back from there because they thought it would damage the engines. I'm sure that they had reason for thinking that. And in some cases, it would damage the engine. But the USAF sent Charles Lindbergh out, because he's a reputable guy, one of the most famous pilots in the world, to preach the good news, which was that you could manually lean these airplanes to get a lot more range out of them. And he taught that not only to P-38 pilots, although that's what you hear about a lot, but also to Thunderbolt pilots. And both of those planes could get a lot more range via manual leaning. And this did become the official procedure in the pilot manual for the P-47. So it's uh, definitely worth talking about. I should probably make a video about it, but just hasn't really been on my radar until, really, frankly, you just mentioned it. All right, hey, Don Ray, wish I'd been on from the beginning. Well, you know, it's the beauty of YouTube. You can start and stop, pause, whatever you want to do. Max's models. Uh, Max, I don't know what you're talking about there, but you're probably right. Usually are. Gudvana, there's an army mafia, question mark. Uh, Gudvana, this was the first I'd heard of that, too. I don't know what to tell you. Blazer fan, story I read slash heard is that the four Lindbergh, they thought those configured... Yeah, he's, he's right. I've, I've read and heard that too, that before Lindbergh went out there and convinced everybody that this was okay, they thought moving the mixture aft of auto lean in flight was going to destroy the motor, which is not the case. John McGuire, moderator, asked questions specifically mine. I feel your pain, John. There are a lot of questions, and uh, the moderator could only ask a few, but uh, hey, here I am. Internet Explorer, pride kills. Yes, it absolutely does, and uh, I do think that was a factor with is this entire debacle that we're talking about. Gary Hill, I don't think that they had ill intent. They refused to let go of their obsolete doctrine. Yeah, Gary, you're, you're absolutely right here. In fact, I've noticed that in the comments section, some people that apparently didn't watch my range, deceit, and treachery, treachery video or listen to what I said in the debate really got this all wrong. I never said that I think that the bomber mafia was trying to kill people or trying to increase losses. On the contrary, they were true believers in the bomber. They really thought that was the way to win the war. And they thought that their ideas of the self-escorting bomber, large formations, defensive guns, and so forth, they really thought that was the answer. And my issue with them is twofold. One, they stuck to their guns on that way too long. I mean, the cat was totally out of the bag. The Luftwaffe learned this the hard way. You need escort fighters. They're not desirable. They're required. The Japanese learned this the hard way. In fact, Claire Chenault will have something to say about that. Uh, the British certainly learned this the hard way. The Italians learned this the hard way. Everybody in the world had figured this out, but the U.S. held on to this obsolete idea way too long, and it cost a lot of lives. And furthermore, their backup plan should have been drop tanks, because that was something that was a sure thing and was well understood. But instead, they were so enamored with the bomber idea that their first backup plan was the YB-40, which, even without the benefit of 2020 hindsight, I think just had to seem invalid, and that's putting it kindly. Um, anyway, I don't think that the bomber mafia had ill intent. I do think that they really, really fumbled the ball in 1942, and then to protect their careers and future budget battles, they covered it up in 1944 with this nonsense about the uh, not being able to escort into Germany until the P-51 showed up. That was just not the case. Um, just another consumer says, uh, very real problem. People are who are experts in what was true 10 years ago. Yeah, and that is a factor here. Um, not even 10 years ago, 1935, 1936, you could make a real argument that bombers were going to be very difficult for the fighters of those years to intercept. Absolutely. Uh, there is an issue of failing to understand the way things have been progressing. So that's it for this video. I really, really appreciate you guys watching. Let me know what you think in the comments. I, I don't know if I want to do five more of these videos, although I will say it's really quick. Uh, the last picture that we'll show is uh, Neil Kirby, Pacific Theater Ace, and with him, I'm sure you recognize him, is John Wayne. This is, you know, I know some other YouTube channels watch my videos and take these like little tidbits that I mention but don't go into, usually because it's something that's not my thing, and they make a whole video out of it. And I think this is actually an example of uh, a situation where that might be something worth doing. So John Wayne is sitting in the P-47, and the story is, and I don't know 100% this is true, because when people do an illegal thing, they tend to not document it really well, although 
these days people are dumb enough to do that sometimes. But the story is that John Wayne actually flew the P-47, and the way that happened is they got a little little pilot, and he sat, you know, the P-47's cockpit is pretty big. And with the seat, the seat and rudder pedals adjusted a certain way, the lower guy could essentially sit on John Wayne's lap, and he did the takeoff, and then John Wayne got to take the controls and even fire the machine gun at one point. Um, I kind of think that story is true. I don't know. But I thought it would make for an interesting YouTube video if somebody wanted to tackle that. Anyway, that's all I've got, guys. So I hope you're having a great day. Goodbye.